Check Podcasts. Hi, I'm Bruce Williams. I'm the CEO of the Greater Victoria Chamber of Commerce. Welcome to Chamber Chats, coming to you as always from the podcasting studios here at the Czech Media Group, one of our Chamber Champions. I would like to begin by acknowledging, as always, that I live and work in the ancestral territories of the Lekwungen speaking nations, the Songhees, and the Esquimalt. And Chamber Chats is made possible by the support of Island Savings, a division of First West Credit Union, who have local experts with unique solutions for your problems. So, you know, years ago, people would say, oh, Greater Victoria, that's a that's a tourist town or Greater Victoria. That's a that's a government town. Well, yeah, we are we are still a government town and we are still a tourist town. But on top of all of that now, in a bigger way, we are a tech town. Technology is the largest sector within our economy. And there's an organization that manages that sector and they do it very well. They are the Victoria Innovation Advanced Technology Entrepreneurship Council or as we know, the more familiar Viatech. Dan Gunn is the CEO of Viatech. Dan, how are you? I'm great, Bruce. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being here. So there's a question I ask very often on these things. So if you meet a stranger for the first time and they say, so what do you do for a living? What's your answer? I, I, have, a, I have a funny answer and a, and a standard answer. And so the one I like to say is I'm the party planner and therapist for the tech leadership in Greater Victoria. <laughs> okay. Um, the other answer I give is our job is to help uh, te- the tech sector in Greater Victoria grow. And you have done that. You've done it very successfully and done it very well for many years now. Because Viatech has grown at an incredible pace since its creation. So tell me a little bit about the beginnings of it. How did it all start? So as I understand it, I started with Viatech in 2000. And it was nine years old at that time. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was in the late 80s, um, some tech leaders from the, the handful of tech companies we had in the region got together. And they had this idea that, you know, we should probably be um, working together on how we might grow our innovation sector. And I believe uh, the chamber had a hand in, in facilitating some of those those early meetings. Yes. Um, and so, uh, and Janet Baird, she had, was a city councillor. She was a, a big champion and um, and they got together and put together uh, the first iteration of ITEC, which was um, very closely um, supported by the provincial government at that time. Um, so at that time, 70, 95% of our funding was coming from the from government sources, um, but there was membership revenue, and that continued to grow. When I started in 2000, um, you know there was a change in government at the provincial level in 2001, and that changed some of the funding model. And so uh, between 2000 and 2004, I was having a great time as a as a, a, a new employee, but the organization itself was struggling with its financial future, and that led to a bit of a, a, a crisis. And uh, due, due, due to a number of circumstances, I ended up in the CEO role and kind of reinvented the organization as more of an industry association than a government funded NGO. Um, and then we've reiterated, you know, we have to reinvent ourselves at least every five years. And it's, some, you know, more often it's every three years where we have to really keep up with um, what's happening in the world, the global situation, but also what the type of entrepreneurs are like that are starting companies in our community. And that continues to evolve as well. Yeah, Viatech is one of the organizations in this region that actually began as a committee of the chamber. A guy named Bob Skeen was instrumental in, in creating that tech committee at the chamber, which then spun out to become Viatech. But the growth, I mean, we know technology is everywhere without to sound like a dumb question. But how is it that Viatech has managed to keep up with growth in the technology sector? In fact, you've led the way in that. Tell me about that growth. Well, I mean, so the growth is when I started in 2000, it was about we figure about six hundred million dollars in revenues on the island. Um, we now know it's well over $4 billion in annual revenues. There's about uh, well over 17,000 people now working in the tech sector. And, and there's a, if you look at um, uh, BC stats, they would credit the region, the capital region, with um, about 1,000 tech companies. We look at it as about four to 500 that are, you know, gainfully employing people and growing, you know, like you can register a business and be an individual that's getting started. And so we figure there's four to 500 um, companies and they, you know, it used to be, you know, the first company I remember um, uh, being close to that was acquired in Victoria, they were acquired for about $5 million. And the, um, you know, more recent acquisitions are in the hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, so the sector continues to thrive and grow. And, and, you know, I would be I'd be reluctant to take credit that Viatech has created that. We've just supported it, and and really, and our members have supported us. One of the special things about Greater Victoria's tech sector is most um, economies are built around being close to a customer set. But tech in Victoria is not here because uh, their customers are here. Eighty five percent of our revenues come from off the island. Um, as a result, there's less competition. Uh, they don't compete with each other for the same customers, the same markets. And so their willingness to share a gaming company helping an advanced manufacturing company, advanced manufacturing company helping an aerospace company. You know, there's uh, so there's a, a greater collaborative spirit. 
Um, and people have a long-term view of their life here in Victoria. Most people who come here want to stay forever. And so my joke is um, there's no bridge to Vancouver Island, so you can't afford to burn one. <laughs> I like it. That's great. The growth, though, you know, has, has moved along in in sort of in lockstep with the way technology itself has grown. And that presence that you talk about here is, I don't know how else to put this, it's largely invisible. We don't really see, there's not a lot of signage out there, big flashing sign, look at us, we're tech. It's, it's there, yeah. but it's not seen, right? That's very true. And, 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 you know, in some ways that's changed that there's more signs, but also there's more remote, uh, rem- more remote work now than ever too. Um, and so it's always been invisible. Like people see tourism, they see government, they see academia, they see healthcare. Um, but tech is usually the second floor and it's thriving and booming, um, but they're not selling anything here. So their signage uh, isn't a big priority for them. Um, so they, you know, kind of work quietly behind the scenes, um, growing the biggest industry we have. And all that growth uh, all the way through, there's always been this reference to the tech sector, your leader in the tech sector. That almost seems inadequate to me to just to just lump it all together in the tech sector. Can you unpack some of that and just tell me what the layers sure. are? Yeah. So one, you, you you gave our full name, innovation, advanced technology and entrepreneurship. Right. And and so technology is often where innovation and entrepreneurship kind of collide. Some sort of efficiency, some sort of competitive advantage gets created. And it's usually through a technical tool um, that and that, you know, that used to be more through regular marketing, right, regular sales. But now all the tools for marketing and sales are digital. Uh, and so technology has become, you know, uh, ubiquitous. It's it, it sort of fits through every industry. And we saw you know, during the pandemic, we cre- we were part of a program called DER3, which was specifically training non-tech companies on how to implement technology solutions so they could reach their customers when they couldn't come into the store, et cetera. Um, and so it is everywhere. And so what I like to do is describe it kind of as a bullseye. You know, the center of the bullseye is like a pure tech company. They do capital R research. Um, they're building things from scratch. And then you get um, really close to that bullseye is the ones that do development, where they're building on other platforms, that's, but they're applied technologies and systems integrations. And then outside that, the dartboard is the rest of the planet, and it's tech dependent, right? And so, um, yeah, we, you would say we have uh, an influence and a foundation in pretty much every industry now, and that will continue to increase. That's an undeniable um, fact of the future. So you reference research and things like data. We're going to talk about that because that's kind of at the heart of a lot of what happens in tech, of course. We'll talk about data next. Our guest today on Chamber Chats is Dan Gunn. He is the CEO of Viatech. So uh, you, you do research. You do that kind of stuff. You do audits. You, you collect data. What does that data reveal? What, what do we learn from that? Well, you can, one, you'd, you'd get comparative analysis, right? So things like a, a compensation study can show us how much our salary is increasing in our sector and what roles, what new roles are thriving and growing. Um, how do we compare it to another region, another part of Canada, another part of the world? That, that information could all become valuable. And it becomes very tight splices, you know, like somebody might be like, what is an intermediate um, engineer working in a digital space living in you know, San Francisco make versus Toronto versus Victoria, that kind of thing. Um, generally, what we find is like uh, we're, we're very competitive with all cities of a similar size. Um, but the larger the region, typically the more expensive it is. Um, and, and so the higher the compensation, the anomaly, of course, being San Francisco, where, you know, there's there's billions and billions of dollars available. Um, and so things can get um, heavily, um, uh, heavily skewed there. What we're seeing, though, now um, is, you know, through the pandemic, uh, people got a lot more comfortable with remote tools um, and finding talent has been the number one issue for every tech city in the world for over 20 years. Now we're seeing more of our companies hiring people who don't live here. We're seeing more people who live here with tech skills working for companies that aren't located here. We're still not sure what that's what we're going to learn from that. Um, But what it has enabled is, you know, when you're when you can't find enough talent, it will actually slow your opportunity and your growth. Um, now we, you know, companies are able to find people all around the world. Sometimes those people work harder than your average Canadian. Sometimes those people work for a lot less money than your average Canadian. Um, and then vice versa, you know, we've got people who are working for some of the biggest tech brands in the world, you know, living in a cottage and getting paid handsomely for the, for their time. And so that's an interesting thing. And then you look at the, you know, the growth and the contribution overall. Um, and I think, you know, so our, our economic impact is well over $5 billion a year. And that's just so you know, our economic impact studies are very conservative. We don't like to put out like the most exaggerated possible defendable number. We like to put out the lowest defendable number. And so we use very low multipliers for that. 
Um, but we know that um, from studies, I think it's Stanford. I got to look this up because I refer to the study all the time and I never remember if it was Stanford or Harvard. Um, but they, they attribute that every tech job created in the community creates four to five other jobs. Um, and that's because they pay well. Those people um, need the services, you know. And if you look around, you know, tech um, hives in, in Greater Victoria, you're going to find a lot of cafes, um, uh, barber shops, uh, pubs, things like that. Um, and so, uh, so they contribute a lot. And, and remember, you know, I said earlier, 85% of our revenues come from off the island. Um, those dollars then get paid out in salaries and in rent and in taxes and then redistributed. You know, so your average first dollar in economic modeling, um, which is what they call a model that's imported from another another economy, it gets it gets spent four to seven times um, over in, in the community. So it's a massive um, economic engine that we've benefited from. But I would like to be clear that you know our tech community, we're on an island, and so what, why would that make sense? Two universities and a college. Ten percent of our population is a is a second post secondary student. Um, we have the government. We have tourism. Uh, well, tourism means we have great facilities and places to go. We have good culture. Um, and then when you add government and you add academia and you add the health sector, those are very stable jobs. And so one of the things that I've really noticed is um, the entrepreneur that's taking the big risks. Their partner is usually has a pension and benefits. Um, so that provides a stable home for them to take those big swings. And then when they get rewarded, it, it's all worthwhile. And so tourism attracting, I don't know what the number is now. I mean, it's uh, over 4 million people of 4 million visitors a year. I mean, our airport, I think, is almost doubled in traffic in the last uh, seven years. Um, most of those people fall in love with the city and then they want to stay. And then uh, they're like, how do I get a job? And we have them. Or how do I uh, how do I create a company so I can I can stay? And so all of these things are kind of like the perfect ecosystem um, for innovation. You talked about the term tech dependency, which is something that certainly just zoomed, pardon the pun, during the pandemic, that everybody got involved with technology more and more. How much of a game changer has that been within your organization, within Viatech, that like everybody's connected now? Well, it's interesting that there's there, there's so now it's easier to connect and it's easier to connect like you can have a mentor that's not here um, and, and have a very strong relationship with them. So there were things that maybe you sought at home more that now you can get anywhere. And, and that's a good thing. But there also is and I, I, I suspect the chambers experienced this as well. There is a massive appetite for, you know, wetware face to face interaction where people are talking to these plastic screens all day long. Um, and they do just want to get out and meet people, hang out with people. They want to talk to their peers. They want to know they're not alone. Um, you know, and so we have an event coming up in a few weeks um, where it's a, we did it for the first time last year. It's called the Lyft CEO Retreat. And we take a few dozen CEOs uh, to Pote's Cove Resort. And we have great speakers share, uh, you know, new modeling. But one of the, the most valuable thing, I can see it. They, none of them leave the campfire. You know, it goes like goes well into the wee hours of the morning. And they're just, they, there's so much value and them sharing what's working for them, but also admitting to each other what they're struggling with and knowing that they're not alone. You know, the the, the mental health epidemic um, that's that's taken place after the pandemic is very real, um, and it's affected people at every level of every organization. So, um, uh, I think in some ways we're more important than ever, and in some ways there's uh, there are substitutes that are easier. Um, but our job is to find find the uh, great consequential denominator among our members where we can make the biggest difference. Something else that we hear from our members of the chamber is the, uh, the the access to technology because, you know, the big players, the big companies have access to resource that they can be very technically savvy and user friendly, whether it's point of sale or whether it's payroll or whatever it might be. Smaller, smaller companies find that they're less competitive because they haven't got access, whether it's financially or, or, or talent wise, to use technology more wisely. Is there any kind of a solution for that? Like, I guess, equitable, well, equitable access to tech? Yeah, well, I don't think that there's great um, disparity between access. I think there's gr the great disparity is in understanding and, and application. Um, but my, you know, my experience is when you're big, you you have to play that big advantage, right? You have more resources you, to compete. When you're small, you have agility. You can outperform the, the big companies by moving faster, by you know, more custom oriented, better customer service, more personal things, and so. You got to play to whatever your advantage is, um, but I think that the access and availability of the tools today—they're mind blowing. Like w every organization of any size, down to one person, now has enough power at their fingertips at a very affordable price that you know would have made IBM jealous 15 years ago. 
Yeah. And so um, I think you, you have to lean in. You, if you step back and look at your competition and only look at what they have that you don't, you're going to have a bad time. But what you have to look at is what do I have they don't have? And, and how do I lean into that? And you know what? Like the bigger you are, your legacy tech and what we call um, tech deficits um, are huge because moving is a big deal. It's very difficult to change platforms. And so you end up in a place where um, you're stuck with an older model where like there's a new model today and there's a new model tomorrow that your competition can be picking up. And so one of the things you see in most industries is like, a, you know, the, you go through the life cycles of startup, you know, scaling maturity and then they kind of flatten out and tech it's more like straight up and then you know a new competitor comes along and straight down you know there's there's like there's a lot more of that extreme um that can take place uh and and that's because uh the new competitor is faster smarter um and more agile entrepreneurship as we mentioned as you pointed out too is in the title of your organization too and uh entrepreneurship involves finding capital getting started getting underway doing a startup i want to talk about that next Our guest on Chamber Chats today is Dan Gunn. He is the CEO of Viatech, uh, the leader in the tech sector, the Victoria Innovation Advanced Technology and Entrepreneurship Council. What's the Venture Acceleration Program? Mm. We've been running this program now for over 10 years, and it's a program where um, early stage entrepreneurs um, can come in, um, they get some training. So as it works today, if you're an entrepreneur and you're interested in our program, we give you free access to our market validation training, which is an online course that walks you through the paces of checking for product market fit. Um, most people, uh, they, they skip that step. They assume they're the customer and everybody's going to want to buy it. And so we teach them how to develop a, a value proposition and do real market uh, evaluation. And when they're done that project, they have what we call a playbook. And that playbook, now one, you know, we get hundreds of applicants to our accelerator a year. Um, when you give them homework, that number goes down by half. Um, like almost immediately. And then, you know, it goes down by another half of the number that actually completed. So now you're down to 25%. And then our executives and residents, which are people who have successfully built and sold tech companies before, review these playbooks and say, yeah, they look like they have a lot of pot potential. And what we're looking at is what's the potential of the venture, but also what's the strength of the team and how coachable are they? If you're an entrepreneur that knows everything, you don't need any help. Um, and so uh, we want to make sure that there's a, a role we can play uh, in helping them. And then they get assigned an executive in residence and that person meets with them on a regular basis to go over their, their progress and their priorities. And then quarterly, we, we sit down and review with a panel. Uh, I like to call it a panel of Yodas. You know, many people who have successfully built tech companies before that volunteer their time to come in and listen and then say, have you thought about this? Have you thought about this? I think you're over overlooking this, or I think you've got a real opportunity here. Um, and it's created some great companies, um, you know, that have come from idea to somebody piggybacking on our free Wi-Fi in our, in our cafe, to renting a small office from us, to, uh, you know, moving out and taking on a big space and growing to dozens, if not hundreds of people. When you talk about growing those businesses here and, and the fact that people want to live here because it's such a great place to live, we, of course, have seen the shift in the cost of living, inflation, interest rates, housing costs, all that. Has that impacted the sector? Sure it has. I mean, um, Victoria is not expensive on a global scale, but we're expensive compared to New Brunswick. Um, you know, we're expensive compared to some other places. And now remote is an option. So where are you, you know, where are you going to locate? And if you're, you know, an early stage employee, you know, can you, can you afford to live in an urban center like Victoria? And that, that's a very real thing. And it has, it definitely has affected our ability to attract enough talent. Really, though, the answer to that has more to do with housing availability than it has to do with the affordability of the city. There is, we have people who have a job and it takes them too long to find a place to live. Yeah, absolutely. How many times a day does AI, artificial intelligence, come up in your conversations? Dozens of times, uh, but that's also because I'm very excited mm -hmm. about its potential. Um, so it's a, it's a, like I listen to podcasts about AI on my way to my bike ride to work on my bike ride home, um, constantly, uh, trying to understand exactly where we're at. And, you know, to me, I remember the late nineties and the internet. And then I remember 1999 to 2001. And when it, the switch finally went on that the internet became a commercial opportunity. And then after the dot-com bubble burst, and then, you know, 2002 to 2007, the growth was crazy. Um, we're at 1999 with the internet, and but this is a bigger opportunity. Uh, this is going to disrupt more than, than we can truly imagine. Um, and one of the things I think that's interesting in these AI conversations I'm having is, I think because of social media, 
we've seen how technology can become a distortive, disruptive, bad factor for society. And so I think people are more um, cautious this time around. And I think that's prudent. I, you know, I, there, we need to understand exactly how this can and will be used um, going forward. Now, AI, I don't think is really the right term. These are, these are really predictive language models. Uh, they, they, they take into account trillions of permutations and they write a sentence based on what, you know, what they think predictively would be the next thing you would say um, in this circumstance. And so they still make mistakes. But um, I don't know how many people have tried you know, ChatGPT, even ChatGPT3, let alone 0.5 and 4. Um, it can come in really handy. Like, you know, for me, I might have a press release I need to write. And I know like the three bullets I need to drive home, you know, hey, write me a press release. These are the three main bullets. You know, here's a couple samples of my past press releases. Blam, you know, two edits and out it goes. Um, and so I think there's, a, there, there's, there's, the first step is going to be tedious things that can easily be replaced. Um, and repetitive tasks that can easily be replaced. And there are certain skills that um, are just like the switchboard operators of telephones 100 years ago. There are certain roles that are going to be replaced by AI and then a whole slew of other jobs and um, economy that's going to be created at the same time. But it is the hot topic um, and its, uh, its potential is astounding. Because yeah, AI and automation seem to be in lockstep in conversations with people. They, they, same thing, right? Yeah, the combination of machine learning, where it's actually like taking your ongoing input to get better at giving you answers, the combination of large language models, predictive language models, um, it all it's all an element of predictive automation. Um, and so it's not thinking like we, they, they, it's not, you know, Skynet, we're nowhere near the Terminator. Um, but um, they're going to keep getting better. And then de depending on what they're designed for, my, my personal belief, or at least what I hope to see happen, is that we're going to see uh, more and more where, imagine in your role as chamber of CEO, you have a large language model that's installed on your machine, or maybe it's connected to the cloud, but only you have access to it. And I'm, going to, I'm definitely going to do this, and I'll show you how once I do it. I'm going to input, in, input and have it ingest 25 years of emails. And then I'm going to have it read my inbox. And it's going to say, hey, at the, at the beginning of the day, it's going to say, Bruce Williams emailed you last night. He wants to do the podcast. Do you always say yes to this? Do you want me to set it up? <laughs> yes, next, right? And so um, us being able to actually own our own models is going to be remarkably powerful. What it's going to come down to is the sovereignty of that data. Um, and I think that's a very important thing. And I'm afraid that governments will not be able to regulate this because we've had social media for 20 years and they still haven't successfully regulated that. We were going to talk about specific companies that are involved in this activity, but we're kind of out of time. So instead, I'll recommend people go to the Viatech website and check out their membership uh, data and the whole matrix of who's a part of that. It's a very cool organization doing cool things. And the cool guy in charge is Dan Gunn. He's the CEO at Viatech. Dan, thanks for your time. Thanks for being here. My pleasure. Anytime, Bruce. I'm Bruce Williams. We'll see you again for another Chamber Chats.